Good evening. I'm Finn J.D. John, reader at the Fonyunce Library of Forgotten Worlds, and today I'm reading from A Princess of Mars, previously titled Under the Moons of Mars, which is the first book of the Chronicles of Barsoom by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 16. We Plan Escape. The remainder of our journey to Thark was uneventful. We were twenty days upon the road, crossing two sea bottoms and passing through or around a number of ruined cities, mostly smaller than Korad. Twice we crossed the famous Martian waterways or canals, so called by our earthly astronomers. When we approached these points, a warrior would be sent far ahead with a powerful field glass, and if no great body of red Martian troops was in sight, we would advance as close as possible without chances of being seen and then camp until dark, when we would slowly approach the cultivated tract, and locating one of the numerous broad highways which cross these areas at regular intervals, creep silently and stealthily across to the arid lands on the other side. It required five hours to make one of these crossings without a single halt, and the other consumed the entire night so that we were just leaving the confines of the high-walled fields when the sun broke out upon us. Crossing in the darkness as we did, I was able to see but little, except as the nearer moon in her wild and ceaseless hurtling through the Barsoomian heavens lit up little patches of the landscape from time to time, disclosing walled fields and low rambling buildings, presenting much the appearance of earthly farms. There were many trees methodically arranged, and some of them were of enormous height. There were animals in some of the enclosures, and they announced their presence by terrified squealings and snortings as they scented our queer wild beasts and wilder human beings. Only once did I perceive a human being, and that was at the intersection of our crossroad with the wide white turnpike which cuts each cultivated district longitudinally at its exact center. This fellow must have been sleeping beside the road, for as I came abreast of him he raised upon one elbow and after a single glance at the approaching caravan leaped shrieking to his feet and fled madly down the road, scaling a nearby wall with the agility of a scared cat. The Tharks paid him not the slightest attention. They were not out upon the warpath, and the only sign I had that they had seen him was a quickening of the pace of the caravan as we hastened toward the bordering desert which marked our entrance into the realm of Tal Hajjus. Not once did I have speech with Dejah Thoris, as she sent no word to me that I would be welcome at her chariot, and my foolish pride kept me from making any advances. I verily believe that a man's way with women is an inverse ratio to his prowess among men. The weakling and the saphead often have great ability to charm the fair sex, while the fighting man can face a thousand real dangers unafraid sits hiding in the shadows like some frightened child. Just thirty days after my advent upon Barsoom, we encountered the ancient city of Thark, from whose long-forgotten people this horde of green men have stolen even their name. The hordes of Thark number some thirty thousand souls and are divided into twenty-five communities. Each community has its own Jed and lesser chieftains, but all are under the rule of Tal Hajjus, Jeddak of Thark. Five communities make their headquarters in the city of Thark, and the balance are scattered among the other deserted cities of ancient Mars, throughout the district claimed by Tal Hajjus. We made our entry into the great central plaza early in the afternoon. There were no enthusiastic friendly greetings for the returned expedition. Those who chanced to be in sight spoke the names of warriors or women with whom they came in direct contact in the formal greeting of their kind, but when it was discovered that they brought two captives, a greater interest was aroused, and Dejah Thoris and I were the centers of inquiring groups. We were soon assigned to new quarters, and the balance of the day was devoted to settling ourselves to the changed conditions. My home now was upon an avenue leading into the plaza from the south, the main artery down which we had marched from the gates of the city. I was at the far end of the square and had an entire building to myself. The same grandeur of architecture which was so noticeable a characteristic of Korad was in evidence here, only if that were possible on a larger and richer scale. My quarters would have been suitable for housing the greatest of earthly emperors, but to these queer creatures nothing about a building appealed to them but its size and the enormousness of its chambers. The larger the building, the more desirable. And so Tal Hodges occupied what must have been an enormous public building, the largest in the city, but entirely unfitted for residence purposes. The next largest was reserved for Lorquas Ptomo, the next for the Jed of lesser rank, and so on to the bottom of the list of five Jeds. 
The warriors occupied the buildings with the chieftain to whose retinue they belonged, or if they preferred, sought shelter among any of the thousands of untenanted buildings in their own quarter of town, each community being assigned a certain section of the city. The selection of building had to be made in accordance with these divisions, except in so far as the Jeds were concerned, they all occupying edifices which fronted upon the plaza. When I had finally put my house in order, or rather seen that it had been done, it was nearing sunset, and I hastened out with the intention of locating Sola and her charges, as I had determined upon having speech with Dejah Thoris and trying to impress upon her the necessity of our at least patching up a truce until I could find some way of aiding her to escape. I searched in vain until the upper rim of the great red sun was just disappearing behind the horizon, and then I spied the ugly head of Woola peering down from a second-story window on the opposite side of the very street where I was quartered, but nearer the plaza. Without waiting for a further invitation, I bolted up the winding runway which led to the second floor, and entering a great chamber by the front of the building was greeted by the frenzied Woola who threw his great carcass upon me, nearly hurtling me to the floor. The poor old fellow was so glad to see me that I thought he would devour me, his head split from ear to ear showing his three rows of tusks in his hobgoblin smile. Quieting him down with a word of command and a caress, I looked hurriedly through the approaching gloom for a sign of Deja Thoris, and then, not seeing her, I called her name. There was an answering murmur from the far corner of the apartment, and with a couple of strides I was standing beside her where she crouched among the furs and silks upon an ancient carved wooden seat. As I waited, she rose to her full height, and looking me straight in the eye, said, What would Dotar Sojat, Thark, of Deja Thoris, his captive? Dejah Thoris, I do not know how I have angered you. It was furthest from my desire to hurt or offend you, whom I hope to protect in comfort. Have none of me if it is your will, but that you must aid me in effecting your escape if such a thing is possible is not my request but my command. When you are safe once more at your father's court you may do with me as you please, but from now on till that day I am your master and you must obey and aid me. She looked at me long and earnestly, and I thought that she was softening toward me. I understand your words, Dotar Sojat, she replied, but you do not understand. You are a queer mixture of child and man, of brute and noble. I only wish that I might read your heart. Look down at your feet, Dejah Thoris. It lies there now, where it has lain since that other night at Korad, and where it will ever lie beating, alone for you until death stills it forever. She took a little step toward me, her beautiful hands outstretched in a strange, groping gesture. What do you mean, John Carter? she whispered. What are you saying to me? I am saying what I had promised myself that I would not say to you, at least not until you were no longer a captive among the green men. What from your attitude toward me for the past twenty days I had thought never to say to you. I am saying, Deja Thoris, that I am yours, body and soul, to serve you, to fight for you, and die for you. Only one thing I ask of you in return, and that is that you make no sign, either of condemnation or of approbation of my words, until you are safe among your own people, and that whatever sentiments you harbor toward me, they be not influenced or colored by gratitude. Whatever I may do to serve you will be prompted solely from selfish motives, since it gives me more pleasure to serve you than not. I will respect your wishes, John Carter, because I understand the motives which prompt them, and I accept your service no more willingly than I bow to your authority. Your word shall be my law. I have twice wronged you in my thoughts, and again I ask your forgiveness. Further conversation of a personal nature was prevented by the entrance of Sola, who was very much agitated and wholly unlike her usual calm and possessed self. That horrible Sarkoka has been before Tal Hajish, she cried and from what I heard upon the plaza there is little hope for either of you. What do they say? inquired Dejah Thoris. That you will be thrown to the wild callots in the great arena as soon as the hordes have assembled for the yearly games. Sola, I said, you are a Thark, but you hate and loathe the customs of your people as much as we do. Will you not accompany us in one supreme effort to escape? I am sure that Dejah Thoris can offer you a home and protection among her people, and your fate can be no worse among them than it has been here. Yes, yes, cried Dejah Thoris. Come with us, Sola. You will be better off among the red men of Helium than you are here, and I can promise you that you not only will have a home with us, but the love and affection your nature craves, and which must always be denied you by the customs of your own race. Come with us, Sola. We might go without you, but your fate would be terrible if they thought you had connived to aid us. I know that even that fear would not tempt you to interfere in our escape. 
but we want you with us. We want you to come to a land of sunshine and happiness among a people who know the meaning of love, of sympathy, and of gratitude. Say that you will, Sola. Tell me that you will. The great waterway which leads to Helium is but fifty miles to the south, murmured Sola, half to herself. A swift boat might make it in three hours, and then to Helium it is five hundred miles, most of the way through thinly settled districts. They would know, and they would follow us. We might hide among the great trees for a time, but the chances are small indeed for escape. They would follow us to the very gates of Helium, and they would take a toll of life at every step. You do not know them. Is there no other way we might reach Helium, I said? Can you not draw me a rough map of the country we must traverse, Dejah Thoris? Yes, she replied, and taking a great diamond from her hair, she drew upon the marble floor the first map of Barsoomian territory I had ever seen. It was crisscrossed in every direction with long straight lines, sometimes running parallel and sometimes converging towards some great circle. The lines, she said, were waterways, the circles, cities, and one too, and one far to the northwest of us, she pointed out, as helium. There were many other cities closer, but she said she feared to enter many of them, as they were not all friendly toward helium. Finally, after studying the map carefully in the moonlight which now flooded the room, I pointed out a waterway far to the north of us which also seemed to head to Helium. Does this not also pierce your grandfather's territory? I asked. Yes, she replied, but it is two hundred miles north of us. It is one of the waterways we crossed on the trip to Thark. They would never suspect that we would try for that distant waterway, I answered, and that is why I think that is the best route for our escape. Sola agreed with me, and it was decided that we would leave Thark this same night, just as quickly, in fact, as I could find and saddle my thoats. Sola was to ride one, and Dejah Thoris and I the other, each of us carrying sufficient food and drink to last us for two days, since the animals could not be urged too rapidly for so long a distance. I directed Sola to proceed with Dejah Thoris along one of the less frequented avenues to the southern boundary of the city, where I would overtake them with the thoats as quickly as possible. Then, leaving them to gather what food, silks, and furs we were to need, I slipped quietly to the rear of the first door and entered the courtyard, where our animals were moving restlessly about, as was their habit, before settling down for the night. In the shadows of the buildings and out beneath the radiance of the Martian moons moved the great herd of thoats and zitidars, the latter grunting their low gutturals and the former occasionally emitting the sharp squeal, which denotes the almost habitual state of rage in which these creatures pass their existence. They were quieter now, owing to the absence of man, but as they scented me they became more restless and their hideous noise increased. It was risky business, this entering a paddock of thoats alone and at night, first because their increasing noisiness might warn the nearby warriors that something was amiss, and also because for the slightest cause, for no cause at all, some great bull thoat might take it upon himself to lead a charge upon me. Having no desire to awaken their nasty tempers upon such a night as this, where so much depended upon secrecy and dispatch, I hugged the shadows of the buildings, ready at an instant's warning to leap into the safety of a nearby door or window. Thus I moved silently to the great gates which opened upon the city at the back of the court, and as I neared the exit I called softly to my two animals. How I thanked the kind providence which had given me the foresight to win the love and confidence of these dumb wild brutes, for presently from the far side of the court I saw two huge bulks forcing their way toward me through the surging mountains of flesh. They came quite close to me, rubbing their muzzles against my body and nosing for the bits of food it was always my practice to reward them with. Opening the gates, I ordered the two great beasts to pass out, and then slipping quietly after them I closed the portals behind me. I did not saddle or mount the animals there, but instead walked quietly in the shadows of the buildings toward an unfrequented avenue which led toward the point I had arranged to meet with Dejah Thoris and Sola. With the noiselessness of disembodied spirits we moved stealthily along the deserted streets, but not until we were within sight of the plain beyond the city did I commence to breathe freely. I was sure that Sola and Dejah Thoris would find no difficulty in reaching our rendezvous undetected, but with my great thoughts I was not so sure for myself, as it was quite unusual for warriors to leave the city after dark. In fact, there was no place for them to go within any but a long ride. I reached the appointed meeting place safely, but as Dejah Thoris and Sola were not there, I led my animals into the entrance hall of one of the large buildings. Presuming that one of the other women of the same household may have come in to speak to Sola and so delayed their departure, I did not feel any undue apprehension until nearly an hour had passed without a sign of them. 
and by the time another half hour had crawled away, I was becoming filled with grave anxiety. Then there broke upon the stillness of the night the sound of an approaching party, which from the noise I knew could be no fugitives creeping stealthily toward liberty. Soon the party was near me, and from the black shadows of my entranceway I perceived a score of mounted warriors who in passing dropped a dozen words that fetched my heart clean into the top of my head. He would likely have arranged to meet with them just without the city, and so... I heard no more. They had passed on, but it was enough. Our plan had been discovered, and the chances for escape from now on to the fearful end would be small indeed. My one hope for now was to return undetected to the quarters of Dejah Thoris and learn what fate had overtaken her. But how to do it with these great monstrous thoats upon my hands? Now that the city probably was aroused by the knowledge of my escape was a problem of no mean proportions. Suddenly an idea occurred to me, and acting on my knowledge of the construction of the buildings of these ancient Martian cities with a hollow court within the center of each square, I groped my way blindly through the inner chambers, calling the great thoats after me. They had difficulty in negotiating some of the doorways, but as the buildings fronting the city's principal exposures were all designed upon a magnificent scale, they were able to wriggle through without sticking fast. And thus we finally made the inner court, where I found, as I had expected, the usual carpet of moss-like vegetation which would prove their food and drink until I could return them to their own enclosure. That they would be as quiet and contented here as elsewhere I was confident, nor was there but the remotest possibility that they would be discovered, as these green men had no great desire to enter these outlying buildings, which were frequented by the only thing, I believe, which caused them the sensation of fear, the great white apes of Barsoom. Removing the saddle trappings, I hid them just inside the rear doorway of the building through which we had entered the court, and turning the beasts loose, quickly made my way across the court to the rear of the buildings upon the farther side, and thence to the avenue beyond. Waiting in the doorway of the building until I was assured that no one was approaching, I hurried across to the opposite side, and through the first doorway to the court beyond. Thus, crossing through court after court, with only the slight chance of detection which the necessary crossing of the avenues entailed, I made my way in safety to the courtyard in the rear of Dejah Thoris's quarters. Here, of course, I found the beasts of the warriors who quartered in the adjacent buildings, and the warriors themselves I might expect to meet within if I entered, but fortunately for me I had another and safer method of reaching the upper story where Dejah Thoris should be found, and after first determining as nearly as possible of the building she occupied, for I had never observed before from the court side, I took advantage of my relatively great strength and agility and sprang upward till I grasped the sill of a second-story window, which I thought to be in the rear of her apartment. Drawing myself inside the room, I moved stealthily toward the front of the building, and not until I had quite reached the doorway of her room was I made aware by voices that it was occupied. I did not rush headlong in, but listened without to assure myself that it was Dejah Thoris and that it was safe to venture within. It was well indeed that I took this precaution, for the conversation I heard was in the low gutturals of men, and the words which finally came to me proved a most timely warning. The speaker was a chieftain, and he was giving orders to four of his warriors. And when he returns to this chamber, he was saying, as he surely will when he finds she does not meet him at the city's edge, you four are to spring upon him and disarm him. It will require the combined strength of all of you to do it if the reports they bring back from Karad are correct. When you have him fast bound, bear him to the vaults beneath the Jeddak's quarters and chain him securely where he may be found when Tal Hodges wishes him. Allow him to speak with none, nor permit any other to enter this apartment before he comes. There will be no danger of the girl returning, for by this time she is safe in the arms of Tal Hodges, and may all her ancestors have pity upon her, for Tal Hodges will have none. The great Sarkoka has done a noble knight's work. I go, and if you fail to capture him when he comes, I commend your carcasses to the cold bosom of Is. That's the end of tonight's reading. We will continue tomorrow with the next chapter of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Text copyright 1912 by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This reading copyright 2014 by Finn J.D. John. More information about this project is at fawn uunstorg That is v-o-n hyphen j-u-n-z-t dot org. Good night.